Very quick history lesson. Um, the first HBCU executive order was issued by President Carter on August 8th. My birthday. 80. Your birthday, exactly. Uh, and since that time, every succeeding president has revoked his predecessors and issued his own HBCU executive order. So there has been more than 40 years of HBCU executive orders. There is a common thread within the orders around improving the uh, ability of HBCU and strengthening HBCU, et cetera. Uh, the distinction with the Trump HBCU EO was that for the first time it placed, it housed the initiative within the executive office of the president. Mm. And as, as I probably have worn out this uh, uh, feeble attempt at humor, but I'm going after it one more time, Mark. I'm so important that I have two offices, one at the Department of Education and one at the Executive Office Building or west of the White House, so to speak. So, uh, and when you interview with the White House staff and uh, for the position, uh, when I became a serious candidate for the position, I competed hard for it. Mm -hmm. I believe that I could make a distinctive contribution. Um, Mark, I'm not an educator per se. I'm an economic development, innovation, competitiveness guy, mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer, but most of my career has been around innovation-based economic development and competitiveness. And that lens, I thought, could complement, not compete with, and certainly not replace any of the incumbent good work that was happening with HBCU and the federal government, but complement it with a focus on economic opportunities and strengthening the role of HBCU in the nation's sustained, enduring, and shared prosperity. My name is Dr. Mark Williams. Welcome to my masterclass. I have a PhD in education from West Virginia University. I have a master's in sport management and an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. I even have an undergraduate degree in sociology from William Patterson University. And currently, I'm the global scholar practitioner at HBCU, Florida Memorial University. But I'll also work for three of the largest sports brands in the world, Reebok, Champ Sports, and Foot Action. But I can't go anywhere without my Jordan 1s. Join me and my guests as we explore their rise to the top through adversity and challenges, it's time to help you find a hero in you. Welcome to my masterclass. Welcome to Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Williams, and we are here in Dallas, Texas, Yes, Dallas, Texas, uh, with the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network. And big shout out to Sia and Aaron. And of course, my man, AJ, with the sound. He's doing an amazing job. And I have a very special guest today, uh, someone who I admire, someone that I am just, it just makes me smile every time that I hear him uh, talk. Uh, I don't know if any of you have done this before. Uh, you've met someone that uh, is, is that got kindred spirit to you. They, they, they have a, a good energy about them. They got a good spirit. And uh, from the first time we met, uh, but before I talk to you a little bit about him, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, my situation when I, when I meet people, uh, I, I, I love people in general, but it's, it's that sometimes you meet a person that changes your life. And this person literally changed my life in many ways. And he, he, he'll know more about that today, but this person, his name is Jonathan Hollyfield. Uh, he is at the white house. Yes. The white house initiative for HBCUs. He's the executive director. H how did he become that? Because president Trump, Every president, they appoint a person in his position. Yes, and we're going to talk about that. So let's welcome my very important guest, Brother Jonathan Hollyfield. What's up, brother? How are you doing today? Uh, Dr. Mark, I am doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's exciting to have this kind of dialogue with you. And uh, I actually like calling you Dr. Mark. <laughs> I like being called Dr. Mark. It's really absolutely, cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So, so this is what happened. I remember about a year and a half ago, 
I'm coming through the airport in D.C. and uh, Reagan and in, in, International Airport. I'm wearing my best West Virginia gear. I wasn't wearing yeah. the alumni hat. OK, and there's a reason why I'm, I'm rocking this and showing you guys this today. I'm showing you the alumni of West Virginia for a reason. You know why? Because I'm wearing my hoodie. And his other brothers wearing a hoodie. And I know that see you when we are when we're doing this recording that you can show the picture of us because I still have that picture. And we're in the airport and I see another black man wearing a West Virginia, you know, gear. That in the airport in DC, two black men wearing West Virginia hoodies. Yeah, they played the game the day before, but at the same time, and they both looking fly and cool and fresh to death. Something's going on here. So normally I say hi to people here and there at the airport, you know. But this time, I see a brother wearing West Virginia. So sometimes people wear Georgetown, Notre Dame. You don't know if they went to school there. But if somebody's wearing West Virginia gear, no matter where you're at in the world, they went to school at West Virginia. They're a mountaineer, okay? They're a mountaineer. Or 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 they live in West Virginia somewhere, okay? That's just a special kind of brand, okay? And and uh, and or they're singing Country Rose to you by John Denver. That's our song, Country Rose. That's right. Mountain Mama, all right? So yes. he, he's rocking this, and I'm looking at him, and it's almost like we saw a twin. Like you ever see that movie Twins with uh with uh <laughs> with my man uh my uh, Schwarzenegger, yes, and Danny DeVito. It was like you saw twins, and I see this brother. Wow. And I say, hey, uh, how you doing? Hey, I'm great. And I said, uh, you know, uh, where, where, what year did you go to West Virginia? I didn't say, are you a fan? I said, when when were you there? Yeah. I didn't ask him, did he play sports? I didn't ask him anything. I knew he was an intelligent brother. He's wearing West Virginia. And that's all I needed to know. And other people around us, they assumed, oh, do you did you play sports? Are you in the athletic department? And I'm like, uh, just like somebody saying, you speak so well. <laughs> You're so well spoken. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't that at all. We talked for 25 minutes and had no idea yeah. what each other's profession was. Um, what was it like for you when we first met a year and a half ago? What was that like? You were you were very kind, and I appreciate your gracious uh, recount of our meeting. But you are genuine, Mark, and exactly how you describe whatever energy you got from me, I got the same thing from you. Yes. So it was, was in fact, kindred spirits uh, with something in common uh, that was an outward side outward sign, if you will, of what became an inward connection. So um, it was a fruitful meeting and uh, which really led us to today. So it uh, certainly was a promising introduction. And here's the thing. So I'm standing there and I said, by the way, what do you do? He says, well, I'm the executive director for the HBCU initiative on the White House. I'm like, Wait a minute. I wait. I know who you are because you 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 normally don't. They usually don't show a picture of the person that's in that position. Right. It's not a position that the average person or most people right. don't even know that it exists. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I was excited about it because I know some of the things that they do. And so when I met him, I met him at the, like in the middle of September, and they had just re, just did their conference. This is 2018, and so he says to me, "We need to talk. Here's my number." And give me your number, and we should talk about how we can get you integrated for next year. And beyond yeah. that, I'll introduce you to my staff and in, in the coming months. And let me tell you, he's a man of his word. This is September. This is the executive director for the White House Initiative for the HBCU that is appointed by the president. So President Trump appointed him this position. He didn't run for this. He was appointed, which means that he's pretty, pretty serious, pretty big deal. So you are a man of your word. And I, I and the young people out there right now, listen to this. Do not get frustrated with people when they say they're going to get back to you. Don't get upset with them and say, oh, my God, they didn't get back to me in a day. You know, back in the day when we wanted to talk mm -hmm. to someone, you had to wait for a letter for weeks to come. Right. <laughs> That's right. And so Jonathan, he, he, exactly he actually texted right. me that night. And we talked about getting together. And then I think around October, November came and you introduced me to your team. And I actually mm -hmm. came to the White House, uh, to your office in, uh, in the Department of Education. Yes. And I sat down with your team. And and um, what was it like for you? Because, I mean, that's how what I recall, that you were very kind and gracious in that respect. But you actually did, did what you said you were going to do. You introduced me to your whole entire team. And. And here's to you very quickly for encouraging young people to be uh, men and women of their word, to follow up. That's a part of being a good 
uh, professional, heck, a good person. So uh, your your encouragement to young people is spot on. Uh, Mark, I'm, I'm not a gamer. And our initial conversation, uh, when you talked about esports and some of the emerging opportunities there, um, it was really like turning on a light. Um, the creativity, the STEM-based education that you get from creating games, those necessities are 21st century tools. So to perhaps uh, uncover and connect with sources of, of these kind of 21st century opportunities was very exciting. So you're very gracious to me, but I want to make sure to return that because you gave better than you got. Yeah, we, we the, now, so before we talk about what that meeting entailed and how we prepared for the, 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 the September of 2019 uh, and, and during the time of Congressional Black Caucus, um, what would, what was um, tell everybody your process when you became uh, in a position? How does that work so yeah. people understand that better? Yeah, it's a um, um, very quick history lesson. Um, the first HBCU executive order was issued by President Carter on August 8th. My birthday. 80. Your birthday, exactly. Uh, and since that time, every succeeding president has revoked his predecessors and issued his own HBCU executive order. So there has been more than 40 years of HBCU executive orders. There is a common thread within the orders around improving the uh, ability of HBCU and strengthening HBCU, et cetera. Uh, the distinction with the Trump HBCU EO was that for the first time, it placed, it housed the initiative within the executive office of the president. Mm. And as, as I probably have worn out this uh uh, feeble attempt at humor, but I'm going after it one more time, Mark. I'm so important that I have two offices, one at the Department of Education and one at the Executive Office Building or west of the White House, so to speak. So, uh, and when you interview with the White House staff and uh, for the position. Uh, when I became a serious candidate for the position, I competed hard for it. Mm -hmm. I believed that I could make a distinctive contribution. Um, Mark, I'm not an educator per se. I'm an economic development, innovation, competitiveness guy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer, but most of my career has been around innovation-based economic development and competitiveness. And that lens, I thought, could complement, not compete with, and certainly not replace any of the incumbent good work that was happening with HBCU and the federal government, but complement it with a focus on economic opportunities and strengthening the role of HBCU in the nation's sustained, enduring, and shared prosperity. Mm. And so when, when did you figure out, when did you know uh, when you were interviewing for this position that you were, that you pretty much had it in the bag or just something that you just went home and then one day someone called you and said, hey, you got this position? Or did you know towards the end that I think I got this? Well, um, you know, in any interview, you have a certain measure of confidence balanced or tempered with a certain kind of trepidation. Uh, I felt that if they wanted a more traditional kind of educator who had occupied the seat over the number of course of years, or if they were interested in a different kind of executive director. And if they were interested in a different kind of complementary contribution, then I would compete very well. If uh, the desire was for a pure educator, uh, again, like the position had been in the past, then I probably wasn't the best fit. Um, and I got the distinct impression that uh, my aspirations were aligned with the administration's aspirations. Mm -hmm. And I 
and to get a little bit of dose of a uh, boost of confidence, Mark. Yeah. Well, I, I was, uh, when, when, when you told me that and I came down to the department of education, uh, I met your team and, mm-hmm. um, and you want your, the, the purpose was not to, um, convince them that the body mm-hmm. sports was, but to educate and give them knowledge so that they can make a decision on if this was something that was going to be appropriately used, uh, at the next conference coming up. If data analytics was also something that was very uh, interested, a lot of the HBCU administrators were mm-hmm. very interested in as well. But esports was not the most important thing. Data analytics was more important. And you were trying to figure out, do they complement each other? And yes, they do. Um, you were trying Absolutely. to figure out, does it work? And by talking to your staff, they they agreed that at some point, um, and I was almost, it was almost like an interview process for me because I didn't know what was going to happen. It wasn't a guarantee that I was right. going to have the opportunity to present uh, at the White House initiative well, for HBCUs in September. Um, and so I, I waited. So that was in November of 2018. By January, I think late January, early February, uh, they contacted me. They sent an email out and said, you know, we, we are looking to see if you're interested in, in participating. And it was almost like I never got drafted or anything like that. So I don't know what that feeling is. But it was like the feeling of the old Toyota commercial. Oh, what a feeling, Toyota. They jump up in the air, you know, or Tony the Tiger. They're great. Or like the Kool-Aid guy yeah. running through the wall. That's how I felt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I was excited um, and humbled <laughs> by the opportunity to to do that. But the interesting thing that people don't know is that there was a like a four month period where myself, you, your staff, uh, you know, uh, Ashley DeWall, uh, Isaiah Rees, Ellen, uh, you know, got on the phone and we talked about uh, just how we can, uh, uh, you know, how, how do we how do we make this work? And how does it look? And what's it going to look like when we when we present to the HBCU presidents and, and everyone around? Uh, so that was a four month process. People don't understand that that it was not something that just happened overnight. Um, what was your when you just when you galvanize and bring brought us all together? What was your focus on wanting us to all to talk and get us together? What was your what was your overall goal for us when, as we are discussing esports as well as um, data analytics? Yeah, Mark, um, your characterization of our opening meeting is really spot on. Um, For those uh, young folks, students um, who aspire to be leaders, uh, I'll offer this lesson. Many times, almost all the time, the leader's role is not to declare the answer. If the leader has a point of view, he should or she should lay out a process to bring along his or her team to arrive at a common destination. Not declare the end, arrive at the end together. Mm -hmm. My interest in esports was around some of the literature that you share to kind of prep us for the meeting see the applica- the educational application just wasn't fun and games per se. There were education applications and the development of skills and insights that are marketable and, and needed in the 21st century economy. So you kind of had me early. The team also began to connect dots in new ways. And you, again, should be commended for providing us with the kind of background, information, insight, application of esports in multiple economic disciplines that really strengthened uh, uh, the case for including esports in the conference. Mm-hmm about the conference. Um, It's precious real estate, as you know. Mm -hmm. It's the premier gathering of HBCU in the United States outside of sporting events. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, classics and those kinds of things. They draw more than the, uh, 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 the conference, but the national HBCU week conference is the premier educational focus gathering mm-hmm. of HBCU. And we, uh, generally get two to three times as many requests mm-hmm. for participation as we have slots. 
And that's even after, Mark, we doubled the number of sessions mm. as restructured to conference uh, over the last couple of years. And we still get about twice as many requests. Mm. So uh, here's to you for making a compelling case for eSports that we complemented with data analytics to really uh, provide a groundbreaking track. Mm -hmm. uh, and you did an excellent job and the data analytics folks did an excellent job. And yeah, uh, shout out to shout out, shout out to Dean Clayton because Dean Clayton is a, is a master at that. And also got to shout out your your staff with uh, Sedica and Elise. Yes, uh, got to shout them Absolutely. out because they helped make this happen. Um, and uh, I, I again, if, if those of you who are listening to this um, every year, as, as uh, John, Jonathan pointed out, that they do it is the uh, premier event. Uh, every year for educators in terms of HBCUs um, is right around the time of the Congressional Black Caucus. And it is it's amazing because you have all of the presidents from all the HBCUs that are there. The provosts mm -hmm. are there. The deans are there. Um, and then we got a chance to present our work, something unique and different uh, at this upcoming year. We, we didn't know um, how many people were going to come to our session, right. but Isaiah Reese, who, who goes every year, uh, so shout out to Isaiah Reese. And Isaiah, shout out. Yes, Isaiah was saying, hey, we I go to this all the time, and there are going to be a lot of interested people interested in esports. Now, this is prior to the, the uh, pandemic. So this is September yes. of 2019. So That's foreshadowing, right. none of us knew about the pandemic in January, February, March of 2020. But when we went, uh, there was two things that happened that worked in our favor. One, President Trump was the first president to ever come right. to, the, to yeah. the White House initiative. And it's because, as Jonathan pointed out, he was the first president that took it out of the Department of Education and put, and put it into the White House, okay? Which means now that he's, he's giving attention to it. So we didn't know until maybe four days before that President Trump was coming. <laughs> so they had to shut down half of D.C. The great thing about it, and I, I'm, I'm not doing a shameless plug here, but we anticipated that if we went first, when I did our presentation and we went uh -huh. third, it was four slots, that the first one we set the tone, which I wanted to do. The third slot yeah. was before lunch, which means that after lunch, people might be tired, whatever. They may not want to come to our sessions. And it just so happened that we did first and third slots so that they shut down all of D.C. where we were at. It, means that it meant that nobody could leave the facility. So everybody at the conference almost had to come to my session. <laughs> So that was incredible. So all the black college presidents and deans came to our session and worked out beautifully. <laughs> well, well, Mark, because that was such a great outcome, I am going to take full credit yes. for orchestrating everything yes, you should. to your benefit. Yes, yes, you should. And then now we're still here. And, and the great thing no. about it was... Um, uh, I, I'm just going to make some humor out of it because I got to make some humor about it. So we get in the ballroom and um, you have the HBCU scholars over here and shout out to Elise for allowing me to speak uh, as Absolutely. a keynote speaker to, to all the HBCU scholars and uh, Rod Chappelle, we reconnected from mm -hmm. NASA. So it was great seeing all these amazing uh, black um, executives and people that I've met in my former previous lives. And we're there. And President Trump is speaking in front of all the black educators. At this time, <laughs> let the elephants in the room, come on. People are not happy with Donald Trump as a president. A lot of the HBCU presidents, they weren't. And I was with Congresswoman uh -huh. Sheila Jackson Lee out of Houston. So I really amped it up. I brought her there. So she was clearly not mm -hmm. a, a fan of the president, but she came. She has never come to this. So I was thinking, maybe I'm bringing the Democrats and the Republicans together. This is great. <laughs> and Jonathan's looking at me like, uh, Mark, we still got to get approval here. You know, so I didn't know that about government, guys. So so Jonathan's trying to school me while I'm excited about, hey, well, Donald President Trump is here. So imagine President Trump being at the White House Initiative for HBCUs, a room full of all black, most black educators there. How many of you guys saw the movie Boom? Uh, was it coming to America? Coming to America with Eddie Murphy, and he was trying to find a wife. You know the part where he was like, uh, "Sexual chocolate, chocolate, chocolate." It was like, and it was like. That's how people were. That's how they clapped for him. And I was sitting in the front row excited to be there. Jonathan was sitting to my left, and I was sitting, like, on the floor with my suit on. And Jonathan's like, you're shaking his head. He said, Mark, you really know how to live up, live in the moment, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to give 
the um, HBCU community a little more credit than you do. They warmly <laughs> received the president and respectfully received the president. And more than anything, it demonstrated a kind of signaling to the nation of the importance of these institutions. Um, that helps create a national awareness. Keep in mind, those of us who obviously are Black and have a connection and affinity for institutions, only 19 states have HBCU. Mm. That means 31 states Don't, do yeah. not. Mm -hmm. Michigan. Uh, we had, I grew up outside of Detroit, and we had a small HBCU that closed maybe 15 years ago, uh, but it wasn't a huge presence like it is in the mid-Atlantic South and moving into the Southwest. So nationalizing the HBCU imperative not regionalizing, but nationalizing what these wonderful institutions have contributed and will continue to contribute to our nation was a wonderful contribution. Yes, and I and again, not to uh, not to uh, be flippant about it, um, I'm exaggerating a bit when I say it was like that. I just wanted to do the 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 the, uh, the, the, the reference to the movie because it's funny. But but the interesting <laughs> thing was that I that I that I thought was interesting is that President Trump. He really gave credit to uh, the Booker, the Booker T's, the Du Bois, and yeah. and uh, Adam Clayton Powell, all the black people that had gone to HBCUs and made contributions. I was impressed that he knew a lot. I said, okay, he knows some stuff. But the cool thing was the thing that changed the trajectory for me was not just meeting some HBCU presidents that I probably normally would not have met. So again, thank you for providing that opportunity, Jonathan. But Absolutely. the thing that got me was um, Secretary Betsy DeVos, because yeah. Secretary Betsy DeVos, his son actually is a general manager for one of the yes. NBA 2K League teams in Orlando. And as you know, the DeVos family, they own the Orlando Magic, yes. okay? And I happened to see her at the yes. Orlando Magic. It was an event uh, for um, the NBA 2K. They did a thing called The Ticket, and it was down in Orlando at Full Sail University, and Betsy DeVos, Secretary DeVos, was there. And I had mm -hmm. missed her the day before, and so this was like in August. And so I said, I said to, to Jonathan, uh, if there's an opportunity, can you introduce me to her? Because I want her to know that I'm going to be doing this esports space here. And to true to his word, he not only not only did he talk to her about me when I did see her, I reminded uh, Secretary DeVos of our conversation with with Jonathan, and she said mm -hmm. to me on on the floor at the at the uh, at the at the luncheon, she said. Here's my assistant, and I want you to talk to her to say schedule a meeting with me. And true to her word, myself, Betsy DeVos, Secretary DeVos, and uh, Secretary Bob King, who is the post, the secondary education person, mm -hmm. her counterpart for for uh, for for eight for for universities. And uh, Betsy DeVos is K through twelve. And I had the ple ple pleasure. Yes, I call it the pleasure, my friends, because it's not every day that you get a chance to sit one on one with the secretary of education in the United States without a group of people. I sat there one on one with Bob King and Betsy DeVos for an hour of their time, and they gave me the opportunity to actually tell them about my vision of esports because no educator was talking to them about esports. OK, <laughs> not higher ed. And I'm the first. And, and then Bob King said, I want to introduce you to another person. I'm not going to say they're her name because I'm not having everybody calling her up. Hey, Dr. Hey, we want to get a deal too. But it's Dr. Hentz. I'll say that. So Dr. Hentz and I worked for a last year on finding ways to find funding for HBCUs but for eSports. Let, let's, not, let's not leave that point on in a perhaps more substantive note. Right. The program that Dr. Bernadette Hentz leads is what? The Minority Science and Engineering Improvement Program. Mm -hmm. Words, science and engineering. STEM. That's the thinking that yes. we want to promote. That esports has an application, has is informed by science and engineering. 
Uh, again, it's not just fun and games. It certainly is that, particularly for those who enjoy it. But it is so much more than that. So the connection uh, 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 really describes a kind of value that has the potential to help young people, anybody, improve their skill set to be more competitive assets in a dramatically changing world, Mark. Yes, and this is what people don't understand. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that in the next year or so, people will start to understand. Um, right now, in terms of esports, there's about 500 varsity programs. That, that means that people that are getting scholarships to play uh, competitive uh, esports games. But in terms of academia, because that's where you're going to school for, right? Mm -hmm. Academia is only about 70 plus schools that have academic programs. And I would say, I would dare to say maybe... 30 of them really are, are doing it the right, I won't say the right way, doing mm -hmm. it in a way where there are actually students are getting jobs and there's opportunity for them because this is still so new. I tell people when it comes to esports and getting a degree and, and being a part of it, if this was baseball, this is inning number one. Okay. So mm, well so, put. Yes. This yes. is inning number one. So I think academically, what I love about esports and also data science and analytics is that um, I think that for the one of the first times in a long time that HBCUs have an opportunity to benefit from learning about the nuances and the intricacies of what esports is in terms of academia and how it can raise your profile and how it can uh, galvanize uh, the 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 uh, enrollment and how do you raise enrollment and right now during the pandemic I mean again this is the best time to look at esports as an opportunity to to really look at uh, addressing your enrollment uh, issues because obviously the pandemic played a, a major role. And Jonathan, again, I don't think people um, fully understand that yet, but it was, it was I, I appreciate you providing the opportunity for me to be connected to the Department of Education. And, and Dr. Hintz and I, we've been working together for the last year and we just did the first mm -hmm. ever conference uh, we did a Zoom call with 200 universities, including a number of HBCUs the other day. Uh, and again, I just want to say thank you to her and to Bob King for giving us op this opportunity. And we get a chance to educate these institutions about the how do you how do you how do you find a way to introduce esports in terms of academics to your school as well as the games? How do you do it effectively? And um, and so so thank you for providing that that platform for us. You're, you're so welcome. And the two people that you shouted out, uh, Bob King and uh, Bernadette Hentz, are wonderful, if not extraordinary assets at the Department of Education. Also, thank you very much for recognizing and shouting out my colleagues at the initiative, uh, Seneca Franklin and Elise Jones and Arthur uh, McMahon and Tammy Ferguson all rally around this signature event uh, for the conference as well. So thank you for being very generous about that as well. Yes. And we, we, um, we, <laughs> we plan on talking about so much stuff. I mean, you know, uh, I know you're probably people are, well, why is he talking about this? Like, well, because it's important that people understand the history of what this was and what this is and who Jonathan uh, uh, Hollyfield is. And you mentioned, you heard him mention, you can just do it in there. Yeah. He's also an attorney as well. So, I mean, there's a lot that's, that we have to unpack. And I, Jonathan, we're not, we're almost near the time of our, of, of, of this, of this podcast um, coming to an end, but I want, I, I've got to bring you back because there's no way I can do you justice by, by, by just talking about this only because there's so much to you other than too much more to you than just talking about this. Um, like for example, uh, I, I, I still, I'm, I'm still confused why you chose to, to wear some other colors. And it, I mean, I, I don't want, you know, this this right here is the first, okay? A Phi A, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I, I don't understand. What, 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 what is up? You, we, we were here. How did you wind up going to another fraternity? What's up with that? Well, um, to put it as diplomatically as I possibly can, Alpha is primitive man. Omega is evolved man. Okay. Now you, you he's calling Dr. King primitive, okay? 
That you, you, I don't oh, think anybody no, out there likes no, that. No, no, this goes to you, Mark. Oh, to me. Oh, okay. Anybody else into this? Okay. No, <laughs> you this said primitive you and evolve. And me. <laughs> okay. You said primitive and evolve. Okay. So That's I don't right. know. Alpha is the first letter of the alphabet, and omega is the last. So through all the Greek alphabet, you end up the culmination, the capstone is Omega. And I chose Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity. And it has been a wonderful association. And I certainly, and please, and I hope your audience knows, this is the banter. Yes. But back is for real. Yeah, we're smiling, see? But I'll tell the women that are out there, you hang out with Kappas, you party with Omegas, but you marry Alpha. And I'll end it there. <laughs> Jonathan, listen. Oh, you know what? I can go with you all day, but I'm going to be respectful, Mark. How about that? No, that's good. You could, you're you're good. Right. You go, you, you're coming back, okay? Because you are now trans you're transitioning right now yeah. uh, from being in this amazing role. And um, you're not sure if the new administration will retain you because they might. You never know. You did such an amazing job. But if they don't retain you, to be uh, in that position still, what are you? What are you thinking about? What are your future plans? What do you? What do you see in the next five to ten years for yourself? No, forget ten years. In the next three to five years, what do you see yourself doing? Do you see yourself staying engaged in uh, in, in the education? Do you see yourself uh, finding what yourself learning that, or being immersed into the esports space? Uh, where Where do you see yourself going? Um, I have described myself as an opportunity warrior. Mm -hmm. That fight for opportunity, not just the traditional, narrow, coffin corner opportunities, but the best opportunities that we have as a nation and frankly, the world. So I certainly expect to continue to be in the arena, expanding opportunity beyond the coffin corner and into the rest of our national and global playing field. In other words, pursuing an inclusive U.S. competitiveness. The term competitiveness, Mark, certainly has a colloquial dimension. It's about trying hard, showing up to the game and, and competing hard. Absolutely. But it also has an economic and academic definition about competing uh, in the global marketplace or in the national market pace. The ability to do that successfully while raising your standard of living. Those opportunities that are connected to U.S. competitiveness will determine the economic future of our nation. That's why you always hear the best opportunities, legislatively, philanthropically, corporately, support U.S. competitiveness. Mm. And that's where we and I want to help connect more underserved and or disconnected populations. On that note, you've been listening to the brilliance of Jonathan Hollyfield, attorney Jonathan Hollifield. So don't don't get it twisted, okay? He isn't educated, but the brother's educated. And West Virginia alum, yes, alumni. Yes. I keep that here all the time on my desk here. Got to represent Mountaineers, okay? How are we looking about? You know, you know, Bob Huggins is about to become the fourth all-time leading scorer, uh, a coach and coach ever, in this upcoming year. A absolutely, and he's not yet in the Basketball Hall of Fame. That's that just um, uh, 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 baffles the mind. And before we go, we have to do it. Let's go, Mountaineers. <laughs> Thank you. I thought you let would leave me hanging. No, 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 no. I'm going to do it loudly because I was I was sitting here and I was I was looking at the time and I was like, so you do it again. Let's go, Mountaineers. My man. There we go. Listen, we're going to come back um, probably soon. I'm not sure because I'm sure John's is going to be doing something exciting. And we're going to, and you and I need to talk because I need to get you looped into some of the things that I'm going to be doing with these sports at some of these universities and some of these cities. I think you're going to be very excited about. Um, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan, for taking the time. I know you're down there in the, in the cold weather down in Virginia. I, I'm, I'm cold here in Dallas, too, but I'm about to go back to Miami <laughs> in 80 degrees. 
Well, well, say hello to my sister-in-law, a retired Dallas police officer on your way out. How oh. about that? Oh, that's good. As long as she can protect, <laughs> that's great. I'll be happy. <laughs> that's right. So, everyone, you've been listening to Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast on the Esports Future Ride Podcast Network, powered by, powered by Innovation Media Enterprises. Got to thank to you, Aaron, my man AJ, making us sound good. And, of course, my host, well, my co-host today, my partner in crime. Well, it's not a crime. We're not creating any crimes here. We have my, my great guest, uh, Jonathan Hollyfield. Thank you for everything. Thank you. you are going to come back. We're going to talk about Romulus. Yes. We're going to talk about how amazing your, <laughs> your relatives were as athletes. We're going to talk about all those wonderful things about you being a great athlete, getting drafted in the NFL, everything. Yes, so yes, he played in the NFL, too. I, there's so much to talk about this, brother. That's why I didn't talk about that today, so I know he could come back. And so, you know what I'm saying? So, remember. Absolutely. Yes, I, I got to do that. And so, I got I to thank again, uh, Jacob, for partners. Jacob, yeah, thank you so much again for this wonderful opportunity. See ya. And Aaron, you've done an amazing job. Thank you so much. And everyone that's listening out there, please understand this, okay? You cannot control other people. You can't. Remember, you can control three things. You can control yourself. You control three things. What you think, what you do, and what you say. Let me repeat that. You can control what you think, what you do, and what you say. I pray you have a great day. Please practice social distancing. Please wear that mask. It's so important, my friends. And I look forward to, look forward to seeing you in another episode of Dr. Mark's Masterclass Podcast. Peace. Thanks for listening to Dr. Mark's Masterclass. I pray you enjoyed yourself today. I had a good time. I don't know about you, but this podcast is part of the Esports Future Ride Podcast Network and is produced by Innovation Media Enterprises, Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and let us know how we're doing by leaving a comment or a review. Class dismissed.